Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 25 miniseries with the New York Yankees. We are about to begin free agency and I know there's a lot of new viewers to the channel over the past few days which I sincerely appreciate. If you're uh, watching these videos and you enjoy them, uh, if you'd subscribe to the channel would appreciate that even more and even if you're a uh, more tenured viewer of our series if you haven't subscribed, I uh, would appreciate it. It would certainly help us uh, continue to grow the channel. And we are beginning the free agency period of our first offseason with the Yankees. As I mentioned at the top, this is a mini-series, so I appreciate the comments to kind of what we had done with some of the trades and the plan for free agency uh, to the last episode and to all of the episodes in this series. But just to kind of let you know where I'm coming from in terms of my thought process, I am definitely more short to medium term focused in this playthrough, knowing that I'm only going to be doing it for several seasons than I would be in a long playthrough, uh, more similar to what I've been doing with the Buffalo Wings in OOTP 24 over the past close to a year, where I certainly have more of a medium to long-term focus. So thinking about that Giancarlo Stanton trade, I needed to include Dominguez just to get them to do the deal, period. And even with only Dominguez and Stanton in the deal, the Yankees would have to be retaining about 65% to 70% of the contract. And at that level, it just didn't make sense for me to do it, which is why I included several other prospects and a few other players to get the retention down to a more reasonable amount that I could be spending over these next three or four seasons. Quite honestly, if I knew I was going to be playing with the Yankees for a decade or two, the right decision this offseason might have been just to keep the Stanton contract, hope he'd get healthy, and continue to try to develop Dominguez. But I definitely have had more of a short-term focus. And we're going to see that in free agency here too, since I know I'm just playing for a few years. I agree with the thought that... Uh, Cody Bellinger is probably a bit overpriced for what he is. $17 million a year is what he's asking for. He's above average defensively, a little above average on the base paths. And when you look at his batting ratings overall, arguably a little bit above average, but certainly not much. So $17 million a year for him is probably not a contract that I would make if I was going to be playing the next decade or two with the Yankees. But right now, my goal is to spend the money that I have in the best way possible, given the opportunity set in front of me, and try to hopefully win a World Series or two over the next three or four or five seasons with the Yankees. And in that scenario, uh, if I think that Bellinger is the best outfielder out there, and we've got an outfield hole to fill. And we can fill that hole by only spending money rather than trading away players. It's probably the way that I'm going to fill it. So just a warning up front that um, I definitely recognize that my decision making in this playthrough is more short and medium term than what I would do in a series that's going to be going on for decades in the game and months in real time. So, just wanted to provide that context because I think uh, if I was the general manager, as I said, of some situation where we were playing for a lot longer, I'd probably be making some different decisions. And you can see that unfortunately since our scout retired uh, less than a month ago and we've hired a new scout, our uh, scouting accuracy is not necessarily exceptional on a lot of these free agents. We're trying to get updated scouting reports, uh, but the benefit I have here in March of 2024 is that uh, these are all real players, and uh, we kind of know who they are in the real world, so I've got a pretty good hunch of how they should be rated in OOTP as well. So the fog of war is definitely uh, 
lifted a bit, despite the fact that my scouting accuracies, according to my scout in the game, aren't necessarily all that high. And I do think that the scouting uh, definitely could use a tweak or two. There was actually a new patch to the game that came out this morning that I've downloaded. So thank you to the OOTP team and the developers for getting that out there. I believe that it's uh, going to be most impactful if you start a new game. Uh, so some of the little blips in the game that uh, I and others have been noticing and complaining about over the last uh, couple of days since the game came out should be getting better. But we may not see that all in this version since this is a game that was started a couple of days ago. But looking at the scouting report on Blake Snell, um, you know, they're kind of saying he's a middle of the rotation guy and he offers up dull consistency. Uh, I honestly see a similar thing with my scouting report on Garrett Cole. Uh, his value is as a mid rotation starter, uh, which I believe is a bit unnecessarily harsh. Um, I do think that uh, Cole is uh, someone who arguably has been the best pitcher in baseball over the last half decade. So to see him with this arsenal here where a 55 fastball is allegedly his best pitch, um, I don't know if it's just the new rating system or I don't know if there's something um, off with the game, but I'm sure the developers will be figuring out how to handle that better going forward. So taking a look at the free agent starting pitchers and back to Blake Snell, uh, he certainly has overwhelmingly the best stuff of anyone out there on the free agent market. His movement's kind of more average and his control actually below average. So he's going to walk some batters. But given that we are a win now team and we do have a whole in our rotation after trading away Nestor Cortez this offseason. I think uh, Snell is a guy that we are going to try to bring on board. He's looking for $27.5 million a year over eight years with a player option, even though, uh, as I mentioned, I'm thinking more short and medium term than long term. I certainly don't want to try to sign, sign him for eight years uh, in case the contract goes bad or in case I do end up playing longer before I start my long-term playthrough this year on the channel. So I'm going to likely offer him less favorable terms and conditions than the ones he is looking for and see if maybe we can also slightly front load the contract to ensure that when the likes of Anthony Volpe and some of our other young players, Austin Wells, start getting into their arbitration years and making more money, there will be a little bit of a natural offset for that in Snell's potential contract. So Snell was looking for eight years, $27.5 million a year with a player option in the final season. We're actually going to keep a player option in for him in the final season, but it's a six-year contract and it's a bit front-loaded, declining by a million every year. So that's the least valuable year, and it's a contract that'll have the player option on. Ends up being an average of $25 million a year, uh, so about two and a half less than he was looking for. Uh, didn't tweak the bonus for the Cy Young Award or the All-Star at all. I'll actually increase the Cy Young Award bonus for him. If he's able to win a Cy Young Award for us, uh, we would view that as a big win. I think there's a chance he'll accept this. Um, we'll see what he's thinking about it. Yeah, and he's willing to think about it. So we've got an offer out to Snell. Six years, $150 million total. Uh, would love to add him into the rotation, even though uh, he's got issues like everybody. There's no perfect player out there, but I think that uh, he could be an interesting addition to the team. And I'm also going to add some relievers. Uh, appreciate the comments to the last episode that relievers definitely um, have seemed overpriced to some people in the new version of the game over these first couple of days. I think um, I think that's something that uh, was potentially addressed in the new patch, if I remember correctly. Could be making that up, but uh, maybe not. But given that I don't love our bullpen right now and we got rid of some of the guys in the bullpen that we don't particularly like uh, through trade and or just not renewing their contracts, have some holes to fill and 
again, when I can spend money rather than trading resources away and it's only money to fill a hole, I tend to use that path. Uh, so we're going to go after and probably overpay a little bit for just some guys who are solid professional relievers, um, not necessarily great. We do technically have our closer spot open with Clay Holmes having become a free agent. So it's conceivable that somebody that we sign here could be in the mix to be our closer as well. And who knows, maybe we'll end up using a stop or two. And the two veterans that I kind of noted in the last episode that I liked uh, the most and thought were somewhat more reasonable in their pricing were uh, Phil Maton and Paul Sewald. Uh, so we're going to make offers to both of them to really bolster our rotation. I tend to think one of them will likely end up being our closer next year. Um, Sewald has more of an expectation to do that, uh, but I'll make that determination going forward. Seawald's looking for two years, five and a half million. Uh, we'll try to get a better deal than that, and we likely won't be guaranteeing him the role of a closer or promising it to him. But hopefully he'll still sign with us. And we're probably being a little too aggressive with this offer that we're going to give to Seawald. He was looking for two years, five and a half million a year, and a promised role as a closer. We're offering him three years and only four and a half million a year um, team option for the final season, and uh, we're not promising him a role as a closer. Tend to think he might push back on this a bit, but might as well be aggressive. Yeah, he um, has definitely come down in his money. Still wants that closer role promise. Seems a little more insistent on the two years. So I think there might be a compromise that we can figure out here. We're going to give him the two years he was looking for, and we're actually going to give him a little bit extra money each year, $4.75 million a year over those two years, but we're not going to promise him the closer role right now. And he's really insistent on that closer role. So I've got to just think a little more deeply and um, not in a perfect position to make this since we've only got an average scouting accuracy on him we're high on Matan right now who would be another guy who I think could be in the mix for that closer role um, so I don't want to promise something and upset people unnecessarily and have that negativity in the clubhouse unless I'm really sure that um, I know what I'm getting into when making that decision so I think at this point we're just going to look to see if we can sign Phil Matan and we'll circle back with Seawald shortly. Matan uh, doesn't care about his role, looking for $6 million a year, so the goal is just to get him for somewhat less than that. And we're going to be as close to as aggressive with um, Matan as we were with Seawald. He was looking for $6 million over three years. We're cutting it by a million a year, an average of five million a year over those three years, a little bit front loaded, and then a team option for the final season, which wasn't in there before. He's at least willing to think about it, so a little more willing to negotiate than Seawald was. And we'll see if we can add one more experienced and proven arm to our bullpen. And with the outfielders, uh, I do feel like Bellinger is probably the best fit for this team over the near term because I believe he would be a stronger starting center fielder than Grisham. Not quite as good defensively as Grisham, but certainly a better bat than Grisham. And that would allow us to, at least for this next year, move Grisham into a fourth outfielder kind of role. But I'm still going to wait for a couple other scouting reports. Um, Michael Conforto, we only have average scouting accuracy on him right now. Um, I don't think either of these guys is going to sign right away, so we're going to wait for that updated scouting report. I don't think Mark Canna is the answer, um, but we'll at least wait for the report on him. Um, that below average power for an outfielder is not ideal, although to be fair, his contact is very good. And I am actually going to... Um, reorganize the ratings here um, for my old 
brain to go with the more traditional contact gap power and eye um, that I'm more used to from the old version and then the ratings that feed into contact, the BABIP and the strikeouts at the end of my custom view here. So we've got offers out to Snell in Matan. We're going to wait for some scouting reports on some other relievers and some outfielders before moving forward, but at least we've got some negotiations brewing here in the early stages of free agency. And we've gotten our updated scouting report on Seawald. Um, the infamous star ratings, he's only a two-and-a-half star guy at this point, but still has that excellent stuff, acceptable movement, slightly above average control. A nice combination with the excellent fastball and a very good slider. And certainly when you look at what he's done over the course of his major league career, he's been a bit above average in terms of his ERA plus and fit minus um, coming off of a rough year in 2024 with the Diamondbacks, um, which makes me wonder a bit whether he's really the right answer for us. The big drop in velocity scares me a bit. Um, I don't have a problem bringing him on board, but it seems like I have to promise him the closer role. And I just don't know that I'm willing to do that. So I think we may uh, hold tight right now, see what happens with Matan. And uh, there's plenty of relievers in the sea for us to try to find. And we've gotten updated scouting reports on all of the outfielders at this point. And I still think I'm leaning towards Bellinger. Um, we think his contact's a little above average, everything else kind of average. Good defensively, good in the clubhouse, okay on the base paths, coming off of a um, solid year with the Cubs. Two straight solid years with the Cubs, quite honestly. Canna's older. He does have that good contact, um, and he'll draw some walks. The power's below average. He was pretty much an average-type player between Detroit and Seattle last year. A little above average offensively Detroit, where he did have the vast majority of his at-bats. Not as good defensively. Not quite as fast overall, although his stealing ability is solid. And then Conforto, uh, similar defensively. Lacks the gap power, but a little more power in eye. I think he might be the answer. It's just that if I bring... Conforto on board, then I'm still starting Grisham in center field, which certainly helps the defense. Conforto likely lets us move Soto maybe to DH or play Judge at DH from time to time, which could save them a bit. It's an interesting decision. I wasn't going to just blast through the next few weeks of this game right now. It's the one that I'd likely put out to my loyal viewers, who are also known as my worldwide scouting department, to let me know which direction they would go. Conforto's only looking for four years, does want a no trade clause. Bellinger looking for six years, and he claims that the Nationals have already made him a pretty good offer. Bellinger's solid against right-handed pitchers, though. Probably don't want him in the lineup against lefties in an ideal world. Conforto, um, you could say the same thing to a lesser extent, but I think... Um, the splits between righties and lefties are a little stronger for Bellinger.
Yeah, maybe not. I think I'm still going to try to go to Bellinger first. It sounds like he's got another offer out there, or at least he's claiming he does, so I don't know how much room there's going to be to negotiate to make this shorter or more favorable towards us, but we'll give it a try. So Belly was looking six years, 17.6 million with a no trade clause. Uh, we're coming back a little different, only five years. Our average of 18 million is a little higher than what he was looking for. Uh, the contract's slightly front loaded, but not material. Um, but we're not gonna include the no trade clause. We did bump up his bonus for MVP and All-Star a bit from what he was requesting. He really wants the no trade clause, so that's not optimal. And he's asking for more money now too. Interesting negotiation tactic, Bellinger. So we're gonna go back to right where we were before, five years, an average of 18 million a year, but we're gonna include the no trade clause now and see what Bellinger thinks about that. And I think Mr. Bellinger is not going to be a Yankee. I think he's uh, thinks he's negotiating from a, perhaps a position of strength that he's really not. I think if we bring Conforto on board, um, that lets us for at least this next season continue to play Grisham in center field, which is better defense. If we play Conforto in left or right occasionally, um, it's probably an upgrade defensively from Soto. It gives him some time at DH. Not necessarily an upgrade from Judge in right field, but it will give Judge a little ability to have some less wear and tear. And Conforto, we do think, does have a better eye and better contact, um, or better power, better power and better eye, which are um, important particularly if he's going to be playing primarily against right-handed pitching. He's looking for less money, and it's also less of a time commitment, and he also is not claiming that he's got a bunch of other offers out there right now. So I think we may try to offer him even only a three-year contract to keep some more flexibility open for us. Probably being a little too aggressive with Conforto here. He was looking for four years, $15 million a pop. We're offering him three years at a 14 million average in the third year as a team option. So it is potentially only a two year contract. We are keeping in the no trade clause that he wanted, which he'll like. And we upped his MVP and all-star bonuses a bit, not thinking there's a great chance that we'll be paying either of those, particularly the MVP one. I don't think he'll go for this, but I'm trying to be a little aggressive with these guys. And he's willing to think about it. Um, so a much more reasonable contract. Um, really only a two-year commitment. So if it doesn't work out, it gives us a chance to reset on the fly two, two off-seasons from now, uh, which who knows what the free agent market's going to look like then. It's very conceivable that there might be an outfielder out there two years from now that we like better than Conforto or Bellinger. So a little bit of a... Uh, fork in the road as far as our plans now got three meaningful offers out to people at this point snell favors the offer still waiting to hear from matan and obviously just made the offer to conforto right now the pool of relievers is not overwhelmingly attractive um you know if uh well, Chapman, maybe a reunion with him isn't the best idea in New York. But if Presley, Holmes, Kimbrell, if those guys end up lingering on the market looking for less money, I think any of them could be under consideration. And we could certainly revisit some of these guys on the middle part of the market. And there's a lot of them out there. Um... In the coming weeks you know some of them aren't even looking for major league contracts right now so there's definitely a lot of options for us to consider i don't think we need to necessarily jump at anyone 
maybe pick up a couple of guys at a cheaper level in a month or two from now. And then we're still going to have the Rule 5 draft coming up in the not-so-distant future where it's very conceivable that we could add an arm or two who could help our bullpen as well. Well, we've got our updated scouting report on Phil Matan. Um, no reason for us to not continue moving forward with him. And uh, he's really buttering me up here. He says that he favors our offer, and he says, I'm, I've got a very sound mind, and I'm definitely ahead of the other GMs in Major League Baseball. So thank you, Phil. That's, that's very kind of you. And it is a big day for the Yankees here today. Uh, Phil Maton signed and Blake Snell also signed. Uh, the fans very excited about Snell joining us. Um, we will lose a third round pick for signing Snell, uh, given that we've got Holmes who likely will be signed away from us that we offered a qualifying offer to this year. Uh, hopefully we'll have something to balance that out or perhaps even be slightly better than that, depending on how long in the dollars he signs for. But certainly a big move forward in terms of improving our pitching staff uh, by bringing on Blake Snell, who will uh, be completing with Cole at the top of the rotation, although Rodon also had a pretty good year last year and has pretty good ratings in this game. So... Cole Radon and Snell at the top of our rotation, I think, is very sound. And Matan gives us a quality arm in the bullpen who likely will be competing to possibly be our closer this upcoming season. And if you were wondering, uh, we still have not heard back from Michael Conforto yet. Uh, we have also recently completed our latest um, annual or not annual, our latest monthly scouting camp with international amateur free agents. Uh, this is one of the changes that uh, I know is made from reviewing the materials on the new patch that was uh, released this morning. I'm sure some of you have noticed this, um, but the international amateur free agent crops in uh, the early years of this game seem absolutely insanely high-powered. And I believe the patch that was dropped today, if you start a new game, has uh, tamped down a bit the quality of players available in international amateur free agency. And I believe they've also uh, increased the quality a bit of the players who were available in the amateur draft in uh, June or July. So I think those are both moves that made sense because the IAFA class seems insanely good. And the draft classes in the early years of the playthroughs I've done have seemed uh, a bit underwhelming. So thanks, OOTP developers. And some more news on free agency today. Uh, Conforto says he likes our offer at this point, and uh, Clay Holmes has signed somewhere else. We get a supplemental second round from picks uh, for him, so it all works out. We lost a third rounder, picked up a supplemental second rounder, uh, so we end up ahead of the game. He signed with the Rangers. Um, not really the money he was looking for, $12.6 million um, for only two years. Again, we made an $18.9 million qualifying offer to him. So I think that's a bit of a disappointing result for Mr. Holmes. Uh, but it worked out well for us. Uh, the draft lot of results in there. Um, the Mets moving all the way from 10 to number one. So that will certainly help them supercharge their rebuild although i don't think they're officially calling it a rebuild and since we've simmed ahead another couple weeks in this episode uh, check in on our player development lab uh, we have gone with some harder programs and we kind of focused uh, since we are thinking more short term than long term on our important players who are going to be with us likely through this playthrough and a lot of frustration uh, with some of the major league guys in the uh, relatively difficult programs that they're on. Uh, the one exception is Austin Wells, who's excelling in improving his plate discipline. Even uh, Spencer Jones and last year's first round pick Chase Mobley are uh, having some issues with 
their development programs as well. So two to three months from now, we'll uh, know better what worked out. Um, seems like Wells likely to move forward. Would be great if we get positive results from at least one of the other programs as well. And it looks like before the winter meetings ended, uh, Bellinger did get his deal. Six years at uh, $16.4 million a year from the Nationals. Looks like he got the no trade clause he was looking for, although um, he will consider a trade for us. So I don't know if this was the greatest decision by him. Um, we offered him five years at $18 million a year with the no trade clause i believe um so he's leaving an average of 1.6 million a year on the table um and he would have been hitting free agency a year sooner with us now granted who knows what he's going to get is a 33 or 34 year old but uh i don't think what we were offering him was so uh so much worse than this that uh, he shouldn't have at least considered it, but he never got to the point where uh, he let us make him a formal offer that he was willing to think about. So hopefully things will work out for him, and hopefully things will work out for us with Mr. Conforto. And we've made it past the winter meetings now, uh, still waiting to hopefully ultimately get confirmation that uh, Conforto will be joining us uh, still as far as we know he favors the offer so for uh really only a two-year contract a much smaller commitment than there is to bellinger and a guy who i think offensively arguably could be better definitely not as good defensively i think this is the right move for us even though we are uh setting ourselves up by the virtue of the way i'm playing this is a win now team uh, still won't be disappointed if we end up with Conforto rather than Bellinger, who I kind of thought we might be pursuing a little more aggressively at the beginning of the episode. But excited for the Rule 5 draft. Um, I think there may be an opportunity for us to get some relievers who could help us here. And we're going to be picking 16th, so not too many teams going to be going before us. Don't know uh, what the talent pool is going to be like. Um, but we'll take a look right now, taking a look at all the batters. No real high potential or even high overall players, uh, but still certainly going to uh, take a look at them in a bit more depth. Uh, unfortunately, since we're rebuilding scouting, we don't necessarily have great reports on all of these guys. Uh, Pitching-wise kind of a similar situation um nobody overwhelmingly um off the charts in terms of their ability but there still probably are some guys here who we'd be happy to bring into camp so it's just a matter of scouting them out and figuring out who that might be And there's two pitchers that kind of catch our eye a little bit as guys that we wouldn't mind bringing into camp. Uh, one is Jorge Alcala, above average stuff, average movement and control, uh, three-pitch arsenal, not a ton of stamina, but looks like a potentially useful reliever, is a middle reliever. Uh, Connor Cook is another guy. His stuff is a little better, similar otherwise, um, plus fastball and slider mixed in with a below-average changeup. Uh, a little more stamina, not quite as good as holding on runners. He's younger, only 25 years old. Um, I think I'm going to go with the younger player right now. Um, they both have three pitches. Um, Alcala throws a little harder, um, but he also makes more money being a more experienced guy. I think if Alcala's around in the second round, I'll take him as well just for bodies for camp. But we're going to go with uh, Connor Cook here first. Auto draft until our next pick, and Alcala is still out there. Um, no guarantee that either of these guys even makes our 26 man roster, but since we are kind of revamping our bullpen to a large extent, bringing in uh, more competition into camp makes sense to me. So we'll pick Alcala here in the second round, and then I think that's probably it as far as the pitchers, uh, but I am going to take a look again at. Uh, any position players who are still available overall that crew was a little less attractive to me than the pitchers were 
not necessarily anyone that I'm love in love with as far as the everyday players, as I kind of thought was the case from when I had looked at them earlier. Our scout recommends we bring in Ali Sanchez, and given that um, we do kind of just have Trevino and Rortvet on the major league roster, I think Sanchez, with his really good defense, his captain personality, and the fact that he's potentially an above-average contact hitter could certainly push Rortvet for the backup job. So I don't know that he makes the team, but I don't think that's a horrible um, recommendation from our scout. So we'll bring Sanchez into camp as well. Who knows? Um, I'd be shocked if we keep all three of these players, um, but certainly one or two of them is a definite possibility. There's just nobody else that I'm all that interested in. And looking at the organization right now, we're up to 35 guys on the 40-man roster. Uh, we had added also a couple who were going to be eligible for the Rule 5 draft that we wanted to protect. So given that we're likely to continue uh, making some trades and signing some additional free agents, I think we are going to call it a Rule 5 draft at this point. take a look at the results pretty active um we were active in the first three rounds and uh the rockies ended up going five rounds deep so uh, a lot of players picked um we added three and we didn't lose any so from that perspective uh we've got some more options as we head to spring training and uh seawald has ended up signing away we never um made an offer to him ended up getting only four million a year uh for the next two years from the cubs they did promise him that closer role um might regret not pursuing him more aggressively but a right-handed pitching guy with extreme fly ball tendencies who doesn't throw all that hard and is pretty average at preventing home runs just isn't necessarily a perfect fit for Yankee Stadium. And I really didn't want to um, promise him a closer role and then end up having to go back on it and having a angry player in the clubhouse. And we've simmed ahead a bit more, uh, just continuing to have our scout focus on uh, getting to know the players in our farm system and some uh, prospects overall. We've also been scouting all of the international amateur free agents, which we'll spend uh, some time on in our next episode. Still waiting on Conforto. Last word from him is that he favors the offer, uh, but he seems to be certainly taking his time to make this decision. And we've made it into January, and we did get Conforto signed, uh, so good to have him on board. And as we talked about, uh, the fans are happy. Um, but it's not really a big commitment. Really a two-year deal with an option if things work out for us in the third year. Uh, even though we had to give him the no-trade clause, there's a number of teams he'd continue or consider moving on to. So feel like now... We've still got money to spend here over the next few months as we get closer to spring training with almost $13 million available. We've added a big-time starting pitcher. We've added a starting outfielder, and we've added um, an arm that could compete to be our closer and is certainly one of the higher-end arms in our bullpen. Plus, we've added a potential backup catcher and two more potential arms in the Rule 5 draft. So feel like this rejiggering of the Yankees roster is going reasonably well in this offseason. Haven't uh, made any commitments that are going to be crippling for us yet. I mean, I guess if Snell suffered a major injury his first year of this contract and uh, was very ineffective going forward, that would be a problem. But uh, other than that, potential contingency feel like we've been somewhat thoughtful and circumspect in the contracts that we've given out. And hopefully they're going to help this Yankees team be much better than an 84-win team next season. 
And as I mentioned, the International Amateur Free Agency class is wacky good. Um, we've just run our last practice with these guys. Um, so we'll send ahead a day to get the report. And although we're still uh, a little over a week away, about a week and a half away from the signing period, um, we'll take a look at some of the top prospects that we have been bringing into camp. Uh, given that it's such a talented class, and as I noted uh, with the patch that they put out, it's not going to be this way going forward. But I think we probably try to go for one of these monster high-end prospects who happen to be in the draft that we've been working on our relationship with. Juan Alvarado, um, a right fielder who just looks like he checks all the boxes, um, above average potentially in everything offensively, durable, decent on the base paths, and a solid defensive package uh, with an excellent arm, high work ethic. Certainly think he could be an interesting candidate. Third baseman David Ayala, another guy, can basically do everything very well, potentially exceptional power and eye. Another guy who's durable, not an ideal defensive third baseman at 6-1 could certainly pivot him over to first where he could be excellent defensively. Uh, wouldn't really want to play him in the outfield with that poor range, but you can put just about anybody in left. But he's very interesting as well. Catcher Helmut Bernstein, a monster prospect. Uh, excellent glove, great personality, another guy who's durable, and the switch hitting catcher um, with potentially incredible contact and power. We're up to high scouting accuracy on Bernstein. Very strong relationship with him. Not surprisingly, league interest is very high, but could see Bernstein being a player we would significantly um, make a significant offer to and just try to overwhelm him and get him signed immediately. Juan Cornejo, uh, another monster first baseman, um, power potentially off the charts. As we're going through these guys, you can see why uh, why with this first patch that came out today, which again is not applicable to my game, why they are uh, tamping down the prospects here. Luis Garay, uh, right fielder, another guy that looks potentially ridiculous and has almost the perfect personality. Uh, the only thing he would need to have the perfect personality is low, uh, what I call greed, or what they have now changed to be financial ambition. Andres Inzunza, excellent infield prospect, another guy with a potentially incredible bat. Um, not necessarily an ideal shortstop, but uh, that profiles as an excellent defensive third baseman, and he's got the bat to go there. Center fielder Julio Saragoza, another guy with a really interesting bat. And then the three pitchers we've been uh, checking in on most regularly, Frank Brito. Uh, question with him is just whether he's going to be a high-end reliever or a high-end starter, uh, probably more of a reliever with the fact that we don't think that splitter is all that exceptional. William Thrippleton, an Australian prospect, uh, does look like he is potentially a six-pitch arsenal if everything goes well. Now there's things like a change and even a curve that can be difficult to develop um, splitter as well, but his stuff could be Fantastic. Looks like he's got really good control and movement potentially above average as well. Don't love the low, leader, low leadership, loyalty, and work ethic. Um, and then starting pitcher Jorge Terral, um, a lower end prospect than these other guys, uh, but also someone who is cheaper and the league interest in him has been lower. So he's kind of been a guy that we have been scouting out as a uh, potential fallback opportunity. Um, but I'm going to say Helmut Bernstein, nine heads, a switch hitting catcher who's durable, great defensively, has the high work ethic to hopefully help move his development along. We've got high scouting accuracy on him, and he looks like he potentially has an incredible bat. Um, you know, this guy is potentially an all world catcher. Now, granted, um, we probably aren't going to still be playing this playthrough when he's ready for the majors. So I'm not going to necessarily stress out about any of these decisions, but I do think it's a 
very good decision by uh, OOTP developers to tamp down these international amateur free agent classes because this one that we have here in 2025 is frankly ridiculous in terms of the amount of talent that is out there. So we and many other teams in the league should be able to add a pretty interesting prospect in the IAFA period when it opens up in about a week and a half. And we are going to continue also looking at who is available on the free agent market, um, taking a look at kind of the top players overall. And uh, if I could click properly, that would be helpful. Um, Ken is still out there along with Josh Bell. Uh, they, at least according to our scout, are the highest rated overall players still available. Don't think we really have a need for either of them. We've got Soto, Grisham, and Judge in the outfield. Wells, Conforto, and Cronenworth fighting for playing time at first base, DH. Um, so I don't think, and we also still have um, DJ LeMahieu, who's probably our third baseman this year, but could also be in the mix at first base from time to time. So don't really have a need for another first baseman or corner outfielder at the major league level. Uh, pitching wise, If the price came down on some of these higher-end closers, I uh, would certainly think about it. But I tend to think we're probably going to be looking, um, and for those of you who are following along and actually looking at these, it's helpful if I actually put up my pitcher template rather than my hitter template when I'm looking at pitchers. I think there's probably you know someone in this lower-end reliever um, bunch and there are bunches and bunches of these lower end relievers out there that we could potentially be bringing on in terms of a major league contract or certainly I think even the case of some of them um, bring them on board with minor league contracts but you can see there are just uh, pages and pages of relatively generic relievers out there um, some starters as well many of them asking for pretty big money so I think it's going to be just up to us to wait until we see uh, a price that we like for a player that we like and maybe add a couple more pitchers that we are willing to bring into camp. But Conforto, Snell, and Matan on board, along with the three players in the Rule 5 draft, feel like we've made some pretty good progress in hopefully improving this roster. Hopefully the decisions we made in our last episode as far as who to extend, who to bring back in arbitration, and some of the trades we made will help improve us as well. And uh, we're looking to be much more than an 84-win team next season. Certainly hope that we get these Yankees over 90 wins and back in the playoffs. And we'll find out how the rest of this offseason goes in our next episode. Until then, thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.